Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are in our third week of a sermon series entitled Called to be Saints. And it, the reason uh, that is and where we got it from was Romans chapter 1. Paul is addressing the Romans, and he says to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And so I believe that what we've been studying lately as a church leads us to believe that this is what God wants from us, that he wants us to be saints. And not saints like the famous guys that adorn our necklaces or our pendants or that we put into stained glass windows, more like saints the way Paul describes in his writings. A saint is Paul's favorite word to use for Christians or for disciples. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul addresses the Corinthians, and he says to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So according to the Bible, you and I, we are, we are saints. You and I are set apart for a special purpose. But what do saints do, right? Because you've heard plenty of sermons about what a saint believes, but what do we do? How do we act? Because I think if you take a look at the early church, if you saw uh, how they started, the practices they adopted, how they began, uh, we could learn some things. Maybe decipher uh, what we should be doing. A couple weeks ago, we talked about integrity and honesty, and last week we talked about generosity, and this week I wanted to look at prayer. And you could say, okay, this is a really easy one to check off the box because I totally pray. I, I pray before meals, I pray before bed, and I pray when someone on Facebook asks for prayer. That's great, but is that prayer? Is that what prayer is? Is that how God designed us to use prayer? Before uh, our youth group goes to camp, you know, we stand in a circle and we pray that the church bus doesn't get a flat tire. Or we pray when our dog runs away and we, we say we, we want him to have a safe return. Or when our car won't start, we pray. Or when we can't find a parking space. Or when our team is losing 20 to nothing. We pray. Are we doing it right? Do my prayers look like the prayers of the saints in the Bible? Let's compare. We've been in Acts, because this is the book of the early church. It's the book that follows the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The Acts of the saints, the Acts of the disciples. Verse 1 says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Verse four says, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them, right? He's expecting money. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognizing him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So that's the first chapter. Now we're going to head one chapter over into Acts chapter 4, okay? So it could be one page more, could be just the next uh, chapter down. Acts chapter 4 starts as Peter and John were speaking to the people. The priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead and they arrested them and put them in custody. So, because the saints, right, the early church, is preaching, teaching, performing miracles, in Jesus' name, the religious leaders come along and they put Peter and John in church jail, okay? So what are we gonna do with them? We got them locked up, what do we do with them? Verse 18 says, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And verse 21 says, 
and when they had further threatened them, they let them go, (laughs) finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. So Pastor Peter and John, they get thrown in jail, they get threatened, and then they get out of jail. What a blessing, right? They're set free, and then the first thing they do when they get out is they pray. They pray when they get out, and I want to look at their prayer. And while we look at this, while we read this, I want you to think about how different this prayer is compared to prayers that maybe you and I pray. Prayers that we pray when we are alone. Prayers that we pray when we're at church. Prayers we pray before we eat and before we go to sleep. Because I think we pray a lot for some of the same things. I think we pray for protection, right? Uh, We pray for healing. We'll say things like, Lord, be with us. Lord, be with us right now, right? And and it seems like we spend a lot of time uh, praying for God's presence, right? We say, God, be with us. We pray for your presence. Or we pray for our safety, his presence and our safety. But look at how, look at how this prayer starts. Acts 4. Sovereign, which means absolute ruler, right? Leader. Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. In other words, they're saying the world outside is trying to stop us. They're trying to thwart us, right? We're trying to get the message out there, try to advance the gospel, and the world is trying to stop us. Verse 27, for truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Notice they are not praying, God, please bless us. Right? Why not? Because they're already blessed, right? They're already blessed, they're forgiven, and and they're out of jail, so we're free. I think they realize they've got all the blessing. They acknowledge that already everything belongs to God. Right at the top of this, they say, God is sovereign. He is ruler. He is Lord. And they say, we recognize that because of that, nothing can stop you. You are undefeated. You are unstoppable. So they pray, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They didn't ask for blessing. They asked for boldness. They asked for bravery. They didn't ask for safety. They didn't ask for protection. They asked for bravery. They didn't ask for traveling mercies. They asked for fearlessness. I think prayer can become so formulaic and so routine sometimes. We can get stuck in ruts of praying, and we say the same words when we pray, and prayer can end up being formulaic or wish fulfillment. You know, God give us the things that we want. But is that what prayer is? Is that what it's supposed to be? This is your platform for communicating with the most powerful being in the universe. And it shouldn't be about us, (laughs) right? This should be conversation, and it should be a place where we admit our frailties, admit our dependence and our reliance on him, and acknowledge that he is unstoppable. He is all-powerful. And maybe, just maybe, we should just give a little bit more thought to our prayers. God is already with you. You know, when we pray for God's presence, he has already blessed you. When we pray for God's blessing, 
He already watches over you. He already forgives you. And he always keeps you safe. We seem to spend a lot of our prayer asking God for things that he already does. So what do we see the saints do? They say, God, we know you're all powerful. We know you're with us. So give us courage. Acts 17 says, they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. In him, we live and move and have our being. Matthew 18, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Matthew 28, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Why are we always praying for God's presence? Why are we always saying, God, fill this place? Why are we all saying, God, walk with us, be with us. Thank you that you're here with us. <laughs> he is here with us already. We're asking him to, to be someplace where he already is. Isn't God everywhere? God says, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, where two or three are gathered, I am there among them. So why are we always praying, God, please be with us? God is with us. How often? Always. We're saying, God, please be with us right now. And God's like, um, I'm right here. How about we stop asking God to be with us and instead thank him for being with us. Present tense. Let's stop asking God for his blessing and start thanking him for his blessing. Let's stop asking God for protection and safety and start thanking him that he keeps us safe. So what can we pray for? Ephesians 3 is called the prayer for spiritual strength. Paul writes, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, there's our word again, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So in just those few short verses, Paul's laying out what it takes for a church to run, for the kingdom of God to advance, power through the Spirit, faith in Christ, and knowing the love of Christ. And if you have that, then you have everything you need. Do you realize that the early church didn't have a lot of money? Certainly didn't have the money that churches have today. They didn't have big buildings. They didn't have impressive youth programs, they didn't have women's programs or men's programs, and they literally, with barely anything, turned the world upside down. You know how they did that? Jesus. They had everything they needed. So let's take apart this prayer and maybe see what it is that Paul is tapping into. And the first one is, saints pray for increased strength. Saints pray for increased strength. First, Paul prayed that the Ephesians would be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, right? Now, why would Paul pray for that? That's strengthened with power through God's spirit. Well, because most things we do depend on us doing something. Lots of churches have been led to believe that it's by their strength. It's from their time, it's from their money that's gonna make the church alive. It's gonna make the church grow. In fact, there's all kinds of books and websites and leadership conferences, all designed to help a small church learn new methods, new techniques to become bigger and become more influential. And sometimes those things can be helpful, but that isn't where the church gets its true strength. The church's strength doesn't come from people power, but through God's spirit. And if the church forgets that, then they can fall into that trap. Zechariah 4 says, not by might, 
nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Because let's face it, both summer and COVID have had a effect on church attendance, right? Everywhere. There's been attendance decline. We've lost momentum in our children's program. We suspended our choir, uh, a few of our social activities. So what should you be praying for? What should you be praying for? A packed house. Uh, no, we shouldn't. Not with COVID around. Okay, but that is an us, human mind saying what we think God can or can't do, right? That's a human reaction. We can't make COVID go away. We can't. We can't encourage people to be brave. We can't encourage people to return to church. We can't keep people from being infected. We can't keep people from being sick. God can. Is the kingdom of God supposed to be on hold? Is the kingdom of God supposed to just wait until COVID goes away? Who says that? Does God's love ever get put on hold? Is his grace? Is the cross right now just ineffective because there's a global pandemic? Acts 2 says the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. The church needs to be in prayer. The saints need to be praying for strength. Look at the second thing Paul prays for the church in Ephesus. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What does that mean? It means saints pray for increased faith. Think about it this way. In a lot of churches, people will ask their neighbors or they'll be talking to their friends and they'll be in conversation and they'll say, have you, have you ever heard our preacher? You know, you should really see our church building, it's beautiful. Uh, have you heard about all the activities that our youth program does? Or have you seen the way uh, our women's ministry is growing and all the things that they're doing? You know, our men's ministry uh, has some really wonderful programs. You should really come and listen to our Christmas concert. That's church talk, it's church language. And it's fine. You said that, I've said stuff like that too. You know what? Yeah, I have. But what are we supposed to be saying? Have you seen our building? Have you heard our preacher? Have you checked out our youth group? Or do we need to be talking about Jesus? People will come to church, any church, if they're excited about Jesus. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have anything. In fact, none of us can make a disciple. None of us can make a saint. We can't do it without Jesus. Jesus says in John 12, I will draw all people to myself. He didn't say he'll draw all people to a certain pastor or a certain church or a certain denomination or that we would have anything to do with it. And I think perhaps that's one of the reasons we pray for our safety. <laughs> that's why we pray for our safety so much or, or we pray that God will be with us is that we believe that we're down here doing it on our strength and our abilities. And it's up to us and we're praying, God, can you help us, right? I'm, I'm doing all the work. God, can you help me? Be with me. Keep me safe. But we have it backwards. God is doing the heavy lifting, and it should be us who comes alongside him. And we ask, not God, can you help us, but rather, God, can we help you? Just like we saw uh, with the prayer, you know, we can pray for God's strength, absolutely, but it's still his strength so that you can help. Not so that you can do everything, so that you can help. When Peter and John get out of prison, the first thing they said was, we want to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined. In other words, this is all God's work. And they prayed, God, you do you and give us the courage to match you. Give us the courage to keep up. I don't want human strength 
or human courage. I want holy strength and holy courage. I don't want you to come up and meet me. Give me the extra special strength to rise up and meet you. We should be praying as the saints. Luke 17, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. But does the tree uproot itself and throw itself into the sea by our strength? No. It's only through the indwelling spirit of Christ. So the saints pray, Lord, increase my faith. We should be praying for increased strength, praying for increased faith, and saints pray for increased knowledge. One last thing Paul says, comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. The more we know of what God can do, the more we will realize what's possible. Strength, faith, knowledge, they are the height and width and depth that he is talking about in this prayer. Paul says, I know Jesus loves me, right? He says, I know Jesus loves me, but I want to know and understand that love even more. Maybe when you understand how much Jesus loves us, our faith can grow. And when our faith grows, our courage grows. Ephesians 3 says that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God wants to remind you this morning there is nothing he can't do through you. God asked Moses, is there any limit to my power? He asked Jeremiah, is anything too hard for me? And the answer to those questions is going to determine the size of what you take on, of what you try to accomplish, of your dream, and how big your prayer is. How big is God? How big can your prayer be? If he can provide a coin from a fish's mouth, if he can feed a multitude with a kid's happy meal, if he can cause the sun to stand still, and another time make it go in reverse, if he can make an axe head float, or turn water into wine, or send fire from the heaven, or walk on water, or bring three Hebrew men out of a fiery furnace with not even a smell of smoke on their clothes, if he can shut the mouths of lions, if he can set Peter free from jail, if he can knock the walls of a city down using nothing more than the shouts of people, if he can make a donkey speak, if he can supernaturally supply a widow's grain and oil, if he can use the birds of the air to deliver food to his prophets, if he can teleport Philip, if he can cause two of every animal to show up at Noah's boat, if he can use three small stones and a shepherd boy to kill a giant, if he can take Joseph from a pit all the way through prison and place him on the throne, if God can smite an entire enemy army with blindness, if God can use a prophet's bones to raise the dead, if God can calm the raging storm, fill the nets of weary fishermen, dry up the bleeding of a desperate woman, and cause a crippled man to dance, if God can take a ragtag group of scared, mostly poor, timid, discouraged people, baptize them with the Holy Spirit, and then use them to turn the world upside down, if he can do all of that and more, then there's absolutely nothing that he can't do here. He can open up the sea, he can stop any river. He can stop the sun in its tracks and he can raise the dead. He can heal any sickness, make a crippled person walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak. There is no power on earth. There is no demon in hell he, that can keep him from doing what he wants to do. Will you join him? There's no person either it's so far lost or so far gone or so deep in a pit that God can't lift them out and use them. He's bigger than any problem. 
He's bigger than any sickness. He's bigger than any fear. He's bigger than any heartache, bigger than any challenge we will ever face. He's bigger than any prayer that you could ever put on any prayer list. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith because it takes faith to dream bigger. It takes faith to believe that God is good and that he's going to do something miraculous. It takes faith to believe that God can send revival. It takes faith to believe that your friend or your family member, they're not lost. They could be saved. It takes faith to believe that God will fulfill his promise to the church. It takes faith to believe that God will heal. So expect him to act. Expect him to surprise you. Expect him to do the unthinkable to pull off the impossible and to say, God can do it. God can do it and we get to help. It's a partnership. That's what prayer is. Prayer is a partnership. You have all of God's riches, all of his glory available to you. So you pray for increase. (laughs) Actually, you wanna hear something funny? When you or I might pray for God's presence or that God would be with us or that he would keep us safe, uh, Henry Nouwen was a Dutch Catholic priest and he was a professor. And this is the prayer that he learned from his teachers when he was growing up in school. Lord, may all my expectations be frustrated. May all my plans be thwarted. May all my desires be wither into nothingness so that I may experience the powerlessness and the poverty of a child and instead sing and dance in the love of God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. See, it's only until we realize that we can't do it, that we are powerless, that we are helpless, and that it's only by us joining God, joining him in his will, in his work, that we will be able to accomplish anything. God is always at work and we get to be a part of it. So let's acknowledge that it's not about us or our safety, right? Let's stop praying for safety and start praying for boldness, for courage, Let's pray for God to increase our strength, increase our faith, and increase our knowledge. We get to be a part of the greatest thing ever, the church, and it should be. So let's pray for it. Let's pray right now. Lord God, you are incredible. You are mighty and powerful. You hold the universe and all the stars in your hands and nothing is too great for you. Nothing is too impossible for you. Lord, I humbly bow before all of your glory and splendor. Lord, I want to join you in your work on the earth. I want to advance your kingdom, and I want everything that I do to be about your Son and his glory. I want the world to know the power of the cross. I want the world to know that there is safety and refuge and forgiveness and grace in your church. I want the lost to be found. I want the sick to be healed, the blind to see, and the captives to be set free. And I know that you are at work in the world. And I know that this is your mission. Lord, may I find ways to make your mission my mission so that I can join you in your work, increase my strength, that I might do impossible things, increase my faith so that the more I believe is possible, the more courage I will have to do the impossible. Lord, increase my knowledge. The more I realize what you can do, the more I see your vision and your dream for the world, the more I can be excited about it day by day, 
and join you in it. Lord, I don't need safety because you keep me safe. And I have your presence each and every day and I'm thankful for it. I see your blessing all around me. You've given me wonderful things. So give me courage. Give me bravery. Give me boldness. Help me to speak. Help me to act. Help me to heal. In your precious name, amen. Hey, if this worked for you and uh, helped you in some way, probably you can think of somebody that it might uh, help them too. And so this is a web link, right? It's a YouTube video. And you can always clip and copy the address and you can post it to your own social media wall so that other people can see it and they can be uh, aware of where you go to church or what you listen to. Or you can post this link to a friend's wall if you think it might help them this morning or this week. Hey, thank you for tuning in and watching us. I love you guys and I'll see you next time. Bye.